Welcome back to Smile Jamaica. For a number of years, Rastafarians in Jamaica have been struggling with equality. There has recently been a petition titled Rasta Rights Matter, geared towards the betterment of the treatment of Rastafarians and their rights. Yeah. And here to speak more with us this morning is Senior Advisor in the Communication for Development at the UN. Yes. I think it's in communication for development. Good morning, Dr. Carita MacDonald. Good morning, Dahlia. Long time. How are you and Simone? Morning. Hi, good, morning. Good. morning. Welcome to Smile Jamaica. Is it true that they called you Goldilocks? That's a staged name, otherwise known as. <laughs> oh, um, OC, otherwise called. Member of the International Coalition of Concerned Rastafarians, which has launched this um, petition, and you say the background of the petition far exceeds recent violations by the police. Talk us through. Well, first of all, give thanks for the opportunity. You know, the Rastafari community has been uh, up in arms for, for decades now, and this is just, I would say, another violation that has brought the community together. So uh, there was a group of concerned uh, Rastafarians around the continued violations um, of Rastafari rights, particularly in relation to the amendment of the Dangerous Drug Act, where we know that no longer Rastafari or anyone for that matter should be locked up or abused or persecuted for cultivation, um, travel, transport, or trade in, in marijuana. So, uh, Rastafarians continue to be persecuted, their cultivations cut down, um, extortion with police seizing the, the ganja and selling it. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of continued crimes against the Rastafari community. So there was a group of us, including four lawyers, two um, male Rastafarian brethren, Miguel Lon and uh, Marcus Goff from the Raga organization Rastafari and Grassroots um, Association. And these ones gathered to say enough is enough. We have to, to put a stop to this. This has been going on since the 1950s, 60s coming up. Well, um, hopefully ones and ones know of the history of the Carl Gardens massacre, mm -hmm. which was really the, I would say the bottom of the pit of um, police violations um, in Jamaica here, which ended up being where um, the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Bustamante at the time, ordered for the killing of uh, Rastafaris and the barring wow. of them um, from integration into social life in Jamaica. So this is why there's a big uproar, and especially around the time of emancipation and independence, which tend to um, look like a farce when um, it's juxtaposed with these kind of injustices. Yeah, Dr. MacDonald, what, I don't know if you can put your finger on it, but you mentioned, um, you know, Black Friday. And, and so I'm trying to understand why so many years later, we're still having this, this discussion about Rastafari and, and, and having to say that Rastafari rights matter. Why are we still having to advocate for that? Well, it's, it's a question that all of us are asking. You know, um, this is a third generation Rastafari who was trimmed, uh, Princess Nzinga. And our family has been defending the faith all of this time. And they can probably speak of personal experiences from that time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why, why is this continuing? It's because, one, it's not constituted in law that there can be um, sanctions for police officers or any authority for that matter that violate human rights. We're mm -hmm. talking about human rights um, and indigenous rights in particular right. of Rastafari that has put Jamaica on the map. So we need to institute provisions within the Jamaican constitution, including the Education Act, that um, because of the lack of this, there has been continued barring of uh, children with, with dreadlocks in schools and continued uh, abatement of the, the Rastafari community um, by the police and also now, just in terms of liberty, just a, um, a regular person living, uh, you know, demonstrating their rights of culture, dress, uh, what they eat. And you know that Rastafari has put Jamaica on the map and the Jamaica Tourist Board, Jampro, 
all of these government agencies are using the image of Rastafari on a daily basis. To sell Jamaica um, so while the injustices continue so at home. earning revenue from the same community that you're going to meet out violations. This is unacceptable. It's a paradox for sure. We have to call it. Yeah. yeah. So you've launched um, this petition on change.org, right? What's been happening? I see you've gone almost 5,000 signatures, but how many do you need to move the needle? And, and what does moving the needle mean? So, I mean, we are expecting more. Um, it's over 5,000 right now. We have a UK group, um, Brother Asha's sister, Carol, who have been also rallying up um, another petition in support of this. So we have different international expressions of uh, condemnation of this police brutality and victimization. And so we have Ethiopia, we have letters of endorsement. This is not just a localized um, effort. So I do hope that the, the government understands that the grave nature of these abuses on um, in relation to several human rights charters, the Declaration of Human Rights, the rights of um, indigenous persons, which is a, a constitutional um, provisions that are modeled for countries to adopt. Jamaica has to adopt this. We cannot be the country that has birthed Rastafari. That is an international movement respected all over the world, bringing money into Jamaica, and there's going to be barring of rights of Rastafari. It's intolerable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the 10 demandments for immediate action that you're calling for. Uh, I know one of them is in Zynga, you're calling for a public statement, an apology to be issued, um, to acknowledge a violation of her rights, her human rights. Um, what else would be in those 10 demandments that you're asking for or demanding, really? Well, an apology at this point can't really... Um, satisfy, I think, the demands of the Rastafari community at this point. We need to use this case as a precedent. Um, I was in the Mandela Park at a protest that was um, there on, uh, on Independence Day, and Nzinga her herself was there, and she said, let me be the last one, let I be the last one, last Rastafari child that you trim in this, in this times. So this is one of the things we're demanding, is that this case be used as a precedent, there needs to be termination of the police officer that um, uh, meted out this violation. There needs to be um, sanctions against the supervisor that allowed this to happen in his presence. Uh, when you uh, allow and condone these acts, they continue. And that is why you, you continue to ask the question, why does this continue? One, is not in law. And two, we don't have authorities that are demonstrating and modeling what is required. So there now needs to be stiff sanctions with termination of that officer to give a message to the rest of the police force that this is against the law. You cannot serve in a police force and still be uh, violating the law, you know? Yeah. So that is one of the demands in relation to making this a precedent that this can no longer be tolerated. Yeah. Um, from within from the where force. you sit, from where you sit, Doc, um, in communication for development, uh, a part of the challenge is a lot of our security forces come from within our own communities, and um, there's little known, I think, you've been advocating for a public awareness campaign in terms of Rastafari and Rastafari rights as part of this. How do you see that making a change in the way not just the security forces, but Jamaicans in general, um, you know, respond to Rastafari? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, one thing, you know, I, I work in the, in the science of social and behavior change. And one of the simple principles you learn that it's around the persons who have power and influence that have to make the change first. Mm -hmm. in, in Africa, where you have child marriage, which is harmful to a young girl who then gets pregnant um, early and many other infringements on her rights. It has to be that there are public weddings to show that it's okay to, um, that, that it's not okay to marry early, or female genital mutilation where girls are cut, um, you know, in terms of their, their, um, their private parts because of um, a social norm, a harmful social norm. And it has to be that leaders and influential members of the community are showing that this is um, not tolerated, 
or that in the case of um, marriage, that you, it, it's okay, the community sanctions that you can marry a person who is um, of age and not uh, a child. So similarly, where you have acts of violation, <clears throat> there has to be leaders and persons in influential positions who are showing that it's not okay, it's intolerable to have these violations continually inflicted on an indigenous group. We need to be preserving our indigenous group and um, you know, promoting them and, and facilitating their livelihood, their upliftment. Um, yeah. Jamaica owes it to the Rastafari community. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Doc, for spending some time with us and we look forward to seeing just how far um, this develops. All, all the best, mm -hmm. all the best on this mm -hmm. one. Thanks, and uh, we will give the invitation to TVJ in particular as we move towards a press conference that we intend to have. This is not going to be um, another nine-day wonder, or uh, this can't die down because we won't have a kind of coming together of issues at this time where now the world is looking on. So I just say to the, the government who have already made a statement that they are watching this case, let's move beyond watching to action. This is a call from the whole Rastafari community from the four corners of the earth. Wonderful. Dr. Karida MacDonald, Senior Advisor in Communication for Development at the UN.